Our officials will then provide an update and then uh, all of them will be available to take your questions. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming. We're here to update you, of course, on the wildfire situation in Alberta. I'm joined again by our Minister for Municipal Affairs, Danielle Larravee, uh, or Larve, who is coordinating our provincial response, and by our amazing uh, emergency management team, uh, Chad Morrison and Scott Long. Our first job, as I've said before, is to make sure that everyone is safe. A big part of the job over the past 48 hours has been to help the 25,000 Fort McMurray residents who fled north. We've made good progress. Approximately 12,000 people were evacuated by air over the past two days. In the past 24 hours, over 7,000 more were able to drive down Highway 63 in approximately 2,000 vehicles. Our goal is to have everyone evacuated to the south by the end of the day today. Highway 63 is open and traffic is slow moving because of the dense smoke. Firefighting continues in Fort McMurray. We had a good day yesterday in terms of the heroic work going on to save as much of the city as possible. Firefighters in the city kept working to save the downtown and as much of the residential neighborhoods as possible. We held the line for a second day. I want to underline again that no one who is not a trained first responder with a specific job to do should be in Fort McMurray. A mandatory evacuation order still applies everywhere in the city and it will be for some time to come. Please listen carefully to this. If you aren't a police officer, uh, a, police officer a firefighter, or otherwise have a specific first responder role in the emergency, you should not be in Fort McMurray. Yesterday, I urged people displaced by this disaster to register at the Red Cross. At this point, 32,000 households have done so. Let me repeat that appeal. If you've not registered with the Red Cross online um, or by phone, please do so, even if you've already registered with an evacuation centre. You can register at redcross.ca or by phone at 1-888-350-6070. I know the people of Fort McMurray want to get back into their homes as quickly as possible. And I am hoping we'll be able to give you a sense of when you can go home shortly. But as I've said before, the return won't be in coming days. Once the immediate fire damage is completed, there will be an enormous amount of work to do to make the city safe and habitable. The gas has been turned off, the power grid has been damaged, and large portions of the city don't have power right now. The water is not currently drinkable. There are no stores open. There's a great deal of hazardous material to be cleaned up and many other things to be done before the city is safe for families to go home. We are working on all of these issues right now. So let me take a moment to describe to you the state of the fire today. The Fort McMurray wildfire is still burning out of control. As of 11 last night, it was estimated to be 156,000 hectares large. The fire is currently burning to the northeast, away from the community. The weather today is going to be significantly worse for fighting fires. Temperatures are forecast in the high 20s with winds gusting up to 40 kilometers an hour. In these conditions, officials tell us the fire may double in size in the forested areas today. As well, they may actually reach the Saskatchewan border. In no way is this fire under control. At this point, we have approximately 500 firefighters 15 helicopters, 88 fire engines, 12 pieces of heavy equipment, and 14 air tankers at work on the Fort McMurray wildfire. This is Canada. Canadians work together in the face of a disaster like this. Yesterday, I introduced you to the Brigadier General coordinating the help we are receiving from the Canadian forces. Other provinces and territories are also stepping up to help. 82 wild firefighters arrived yesterday from Ontario and four air tankers arrived from Quebec yesterday as well. An air tanker is arriving from the Northwest Territories today. Approximately 40 additional wild firefighters will arrive from Quebec on May 10th. Approximately 20 will arrive from New Brunswick on May 11th. Saskatchewan has sent officials to help with our coordinating work. 
Manitoba is providing addi 22 additional firefighting experts to augment the work being done at the REOC in Fort McMurray. To the people of Ontario, Quebec, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, New Brunswick and the Northwest Territories, let me extend our sincerest thanks for your help. And I want to specifically thank Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne, Quebec Premier Philippe Cuillard, Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall, Manitoba Premier Brian Palliser, New Brunswick Premier Brian Gallant, and Northwest Territories Premier Bob McLeod for this important help. Fort Mackay has been put under a voluntary evacuation order. Sixty vulnerable residents have already been moved. Roughly 450 people remain in the community. We are working with Shell and the Red Cross to evacuate them in the event it becomes necessary. We are managing a number of other wildfires today in Alberta. I'll ask my colleagues here at the Provincial Operations Centre to update you on those fires in a moment. Obviously, this fire is affecting energy operations in the region. Yesterday, Suncor started a precautionary evacuation of its non-essential personnel from the facilities and civilians from the Noralta Lodge. The fire could burn to the edges of this site today. This facility, it should be emphasized, is highly resilient to forest fires, as we have seen in the past when it's previously been threatened by very large fires. But we are still nonetheless taking this very seriously. Efforts to protect the facility are underway, and we'll have more details on this in a few moments. Syncrude has also decided to do a precautionary evacuation of its 1,500 personnel from its facilities, facilities starting at 5 a.m. this morning. The Government of Alberta is working closely with the energy industry to do a careful assessment of the effect of this fire on the industry. I expect to have a more detailed report for you at the end of the day Monday on this particular issue. Let me conclude by saying this. Yesterday, Mayor Iverson and I visited the reception centre at Northlands in Edmonton. I can't express how impressed I was by the staff and the volunteers who are working there and in our nine other reception centres across Alberta. I met families who had picked up and evacuated on a few hours' notice, who are understandably worried and anxious about what is going to happen next, about their children's schooling, about their belongings. And I know that both the Mayor and I left that visit more determined than ever to do our very best for the people of Fort McMurray. We are working to get people safe, then to make the city safe, and to work out a plan for return, then to ensure that that community functions at the same high level that it already always has and then to get that community rebuilt. I know everyone involved will do everything we can to match the dedication and the commitment we've seen this week from our firefighters, our police and our other first responders, all of whom continue to have tremendous gratitude of every Albertan and every Canadian. So I'll pass, uh, pass the uh, mic on to um, our, our officials to give you further information and then we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Premier. Chad Morrison with Alberta Wildfire. So yesterday, this fire grew to over 156,000 hectares. We expect it to continue to push to the northeast uh, over in this direction here and, and, and connect with this fire today. Um, as the Premier noted, that uh, we expect uh, the northern flank along the side to uh, touch up on the edge here, burn to the edges of the Suncor site later today. Uh, as noted, in our experience, uh, and I was here in 2011 from the large fires we had around the oil sands facilities, those sites are, are very resilient to forest fires, largely because the sites are cleared and free of vegetation. These sites are also have uh, uh, highly trained industrial fire departments, uh, and they have great emergency response planning, and they're prepared and know how to respond in these types of situations. We can also report uh, today as well at ANZAC that, uh, that there's less impact than first uh, reported. Uh, we had reported yesterday that about 18 structures there. We've uh, kind of conf we've confirmed, been able to confirm that it's 12 at this point, and we're still assessing uh, to get more information. Uh, initial assessment on the Nexon Long Lake facility is that likely the facility is okay, but still it's, it's still obscured by smoke at this point. Today, we still expect this fire to more than double in size because of the high temperatures, 
strong winds and low, t low humidities. Uh, this will be, we expect potential similar runs of up to 40 kilometers uh, out in the forested area like we had a few days ago. We expect the fire to spread to the northeast, connect with this fire, and then we expect this fire as well to spread to the northeast towards the Saskatchewan border. Uh, it's still a little too early to tell what exactly would happen, but we are in extreme fire conditions. The good news is, as it still continues to move away from the community and oil sands facilities to the northeast. We also now expect some cooler weather over the next few days, which will give us a chance potentially of a shower and will give a chance for firefighters to continue to dig in and make good progress. On scene today, we still have over 500 firefighters. We have 27 air tankers available to assist, uh, 16 working currently on this fire. We have tw we have helicopters, heavy equipment, and rotary wing or heavy equipment available. One of the things, one of the tools I wanted to point out that we do have is heavy helicopters. Those heavy helicopters are almost better than air tankers. They can deliver up. To, they often have a thousand gallon bucket, and they can deliver those uh, that water up to 20,000 gallons in a single hour. Uh, and those are focused in and around the community areas here to protect uh, Parsons Creek, Timberlay, and, and Wood Buffalo Thickwood areas. We continue to make great progress and continue to hold the line in the community. Uh, there are crews in Timberley, Thickwood, Parsons, and in the downtown area. Helicopters and tankers continue to support uh, areas in the Sapphire Creek, the Gregorio Estates, and Anzac areas. And we continue to establish dozer guard and fire guard in the north part here. Currently in the province, we still have 40 other wildfires burning, but at this time, 33 of them have already been brought under control or are being held. Uh, but at, at this point, we have over 1,300 firefighters deployed there, as well as 13 helicopters and many pieces of heavy equipment available. Uh, so the, at this time, I'll turn it over to Scott uh, for an additional update on, uh, on his question. Okay, we'll actually oh. just open the floor okay, to questions now, and then we'll go to the phone. Um, you said that fire is going to meet up uh, possibly with the one in the northeast <coughs> and then move across to the Saskatchewan border. Can you give us any idea about when that might happen or what a timeline is on that? Yeah, the models we predict to by end of day we should know for sure, but we expect throughout the day to, to expect to add at least 100, you know, up to 100,000 hectares to this fire in the forested area. So end of day we expect that to travel potentially that far. To make a difference, are showers going to be enough or do you need heavy rain? Uh, we need heavy rain, for sure. Uh, showers won't be enough. Uh, you know, we're hopeful that we'll get some precipitation here in this area. Uh, the good news is with this system that other parts of the province will see some rain and that'll free up more firefighters to, uh, to, uh, to assist us here. You said there were still, um, I think, seven con out of control fires in the province. Yes, Can that's you give us some uh, indication of where those ones are? Yes, uh, we have uh, one in the Slave Lake area in a northern remote area. It's about uh, 2,000 hectares. There's the other one of significance is along the BC border, uh, where BC, it's about 44,000 hectares. 12,000 of that is in Alberta. We have a fire team and crews deployed on that on our side, as well as BC is uh, fighting that fire on their side of the border as well. How concerned are you about those ones spreading? as badly as this one has? Uh, the fire environment here is obviously uh, very uh, hot and dry across the province. Um, this fire here in this particular area is obviously in blow-up type conditions today, um, but those fires also are going to be experiencing uh, high fire growth. We're hearing that some um, oil facilities have been evacuated and workers have been moved, but we are still hearing that there are others that aren't letting their workers leave. So at what point will the province step in and say that it's time to take action? And what does the province have to say to those companies? Uh, I'm not aware of uh, any of those uh, situations. Uh, we're in contact daily. Uh, with the Industry Emergency Coordination Center. We had a very good meeting uh, with them this morning. Uh, in fact, the uh, Syncrude and the Suncor facilities were both precautionary evacuations that were done responsibly uh, by industry. Uh, they are all very concerned and they are all tracking. Uh, I'm well aware where the fire line is right now uh, and they are absolutely in, in, in full collaboration with us ready to uh, evacuate Safety for them is as paramount as it is for us. Is it a 
Basically, we're hearing from workers from uh, Canadian Natural Resources Limited who says that the company isn't letting them leave. I'm not aware of that. How concerning is that to you, though, to hear that? Uh, I'm not aware of it, so I can't speculate on that. Is there any further word on how many structures are damaged in Fort McMurray? I know I ask this every day, but is there? Yeah. Uh, right now, as uh, Chad said, uh, we're very proud of the fact that the wildfire, uh, the, 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 the firefighters that are in the area are, have held the line. Uh, the water treatment plant did go down for a short period of time. It is back up and running. We brought in some experts for that. Uh, the ACCO uh, uh, electrical grid and uh, gas, there's assessments going on right now for that. Most important, the downtown core has still been protected. The hospital is still there. There was an assessment done by Alberta Health Services. Uh, I believe yesterday, other than some smoke damage, uh, which will take a while to clean up, it is still intact. Uh, so right now we're fairly confident that the critical infrastructure within Fort McMurray, we're holding a line. Is there any sense of how much in terms of a percentage of the city is still intact, 50%, 80%? Uh, right now safety remains uh, our uh, number one uh, priority. A damage assessment uh, will have to come as soon as the situation stabilizes. Uh, initial reports were 1,600 structures from a few days ago, and right now that's, uh, that's where we sit. Uh, we'll have better numbers once we stabilize the situation. I wanted to ask you as well, um, this might go to the Premier, about housing and where people are going to be staying. The evacuations are kind of happening now. Most people are out of danger, or it would seem at this point. Where do we go forward from here? Where might they live in the future, these people who just don't have homes? Well, I mean, there's there's really two phases to it. There are, well, three phases if you include uh, the folks that are in the reception centers right now. Our current numbers suggest that roughly 5,500 of the evacuees are actually in the reception centers, while others are, are have found alternate accommodations uh, on their own steam. Uh, so then the question becomes, uh, what kind of transitional housing do we put in place for the folks that are currently in the, in the uh, reception centers? And then what's the timeline for, for people being able to return to Fort McMurray. So a lot of that planning depends first on people registering at Red Cross so that we know where they are and what their needs are. And then secondly, of course, uh, uh, waiting until we have the, the situation under control in Fort McMurray so that we can go back in and assess uh, the level of damage, the likely time of re-entry, and what it is we have to plan for in terms of between now and there. Um, so we're, we're, officials are working on a transitional housing plan and we hope to have more details for you um, early next week. Are you even thinking though like putting them up in apartments, putting them in empty houses? Like, is well we've already, absolutely, we've already had uh, some preliminary conversations as I said with the universities. The, we know that there's residences that are available, uh, uh, Nate, SAIT, U of C, U of A. Um, so those are our, our preliminary options. Um, there's uh, other options that are being considered as well in terms of uh, um, short-term apartments. We've already had some, some uh, actual property management companies offer up three months free rent. Um, in, in certain um, uh, rental properties, so that's a, a wonderful thing and, and our thanks go out to, to those companies. Um, so we're, we're in the process of collecting the inventory uh, in terms of uh, places for people to stay on that transitional basis and as I said, we're hoping to have more detail for you. We're working very closely with the City of Edmonton as the, as the first spot, uh, but again, we need to first make sure that we know from Albertans where they are right now um, and then and then we'll put all those pieces together in, in the, the first draft of the plan that we'll see next week. Premier, any sense of how many uh, evacuees are in Edmonton now? Uh, or in Calgary right now, or in Lac-la-Biche? That is information that we're still trying to collect. We know where they are in terms of the in terms of the reception centers, but in terms of the vast majority who are not in the reception centers, that's what we're we're trying to figure out. That's why we're asking them to register, and then should they change their location after they've registered uh, for them to update their registration uh, with Red Cross. And that's one of the reasons today we've specifically asked for, for people to register with Red Cross online, even if you've registered at one of the reception centers, uh, because their database is, is we're hoping, going to be more able to accommodate uh, tracking that information and tracking that, that issue of uh, location for people. Uh, so we're still gathering the information. It's, it's quite a lot of data um, to, to evaluate and manage, um, but we're hoping to have uh, a clearer picture um, in the next day or two. Take your two questions, Julia, and then Ian, and then I'm going to go to the phone.
I understand financial assistance um, will start to be made available starting on Wednesday, but many evacuees are saying that that's too far out. Um, what do you have to say to them, many of whom are running low on cash and, and need it immediately? Well, the reception centers as they stand now uh, are, provide, uh, are equipped to provide people with the basic necessities in terms of uh, shelter, food, water, uh, basic necessities, you know, diapers, uh, uh, various, you know, shampoo, all that kind of stuff that, that you need in the, in the very short term. So if you truly are uh, short of, of uh, the resources to support your, yourself and your family with that, that's what the reception areas are for, and they have that material for you, and you can go and receive it. Uh, the, the mechanics of, of uh, orchestrating the uh, delivery of the additional money is, is, is just, it takes a couple of days. So, so we don't want to over-promise and under-deliver. Uh, so our hope is to be able to uh, provide that, uh, as I said, by uh, midweek next week. Thank you. When might school children be put into different programs down here in Calgary? Well, three pieces of information there. First of all, the Fort McMurray School Division, um, now I'm not sure if this is public or Catholic or if it's both, so I don't want to confuse it now. <sighs> hmm. Okay, uh, I, I can't... Um, anyway, one of the Fort McMurray School Divisions has said that for those uh, Fort McMurray uh, kids who were worried about having to write uh, departmentals and diplomas and PATs this coming week, don't worry about it. Uh, their marks will be uh, evaluated on the basis of previous work. So I know that that's actually a stressful thing. I've heard about that from kids in the reception centres. So um, it's important for them to know. As well, um, certainly in Edmonton, both school boards have, have already clearly indicated that uh, all families need to do is contact the school that they'd wish their children to begin attending and, and contact the, the administration in that school and the kids are welcome to start on Monday. And, uh, and, um, and, and I recommend that, that, that folks start thinking about that because I think that's probably a, a good way to help the kids get into a bit of a routine. It's all boards in Fort Mac. It's all boards in Fort Mac? Thank you. So all boards in Fort Mac have said don't worry about the uh, exams that were scheduled for next week. We're going to go to the phone now. Operator, please put through the first caller. Our first question is going to come from the line of Bill Fortier with CTV News. Hi, I'm hoping uh, somebody can give us an update. You mentioned some of the damage in Anzac, not as bad as you thought. Can you tell us um, where, uh, is there still fire in Anzac? Is there still fire near Anzac? If so, how close? Uh, or whether the fire has completely passed Anzac now? And also uh, an update on the Cheecham uh, gas plant right near Anzac. Yesterday there was some fire and smoke very close to those domes. I'm wondering if there's still fire in there or if that's moved on and uh, whether there was any damage there. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Chad to, to give you that information. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Chad Morrison with Alberta Wildfire. Yeah, we can report that uh, the majority of the Anzac community remains intact from uh, the reports we have. Um, there is fire around that area still. We do have uh, air tankers and helicopters working there to continue to secure uh, that area. Uh, as you noted, there is a quite a bit of smoke in the area too, so we don't have all the details on the industrial sites there. But from the, the information we have about Anzac, the community ha is relatively intact except for the, the last 12 structures that we reported. So you don't know about that Cheecham plant and its status right now? Uh, right now we're using, uh, because of all the heavy smoke in the air, we're using satellite imagery. Um, you know, the, the plants in that area, uh, my understanding, uh, you know, are fairly resilient uh, and, and don't have a lot of vegetation on them. So we're hopeful that, uh, you know, they've survived with a little impacts. Take one more question from the phone and then I'll come back to the floor for any outstanding questions. Operator, please put the next caller. Our next question will come from Charlie Gillis with McLean's Magazine. Hi, just a timeline question for Chad Morrison. Um, I'm getting conflicting information on exactly when uh, the first reports of these fires came in last weekend. I'm, I've heard both Saturday and Sunday. And then secondarily, who responded and, and when the provincial forest fire operations became involved? Yeah, sure. Yes, I can respond to that. Um, the fire started uh, on uh, on Saturday. Uh, actually, it was discovered by, by one of our fire crews on a on a loaded patrol. So there was firefighters immediately on this fire. Uh, the fire was two hectares in size. We also had four air tankers on that fire within an hour, uh, as well as uh, two other helicopters. And then we had firefighters on that fire throughout the night. Uh, that fire grew from two hectares in the morning. 
uh, or to, sorry, the fire started at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, and two hours later it was 60 hectares, showing a very, very rapid growth, even with all those resources on it. So it goes to show how hot and dry it has been here, with no rain in the area for the last two months. Uh, the, any fire that starts uh, can move very quickly and grow very fast. We now have one more caller on the line. Operator, please put through the next caller. Next question will come from Cherie Nareen with Sweetgrass. Hi, I think a question is for Chad. Can you give me more detail on the Fort Mackay situation? Uh, it's uh, Scott from uh, Alberta Emergency Management Agency. So, uh, uh, the Alberta, Managing, Alberta Emergency Management Agency has a fairly robust uh, First Nations Emergency Management team. Uh, that works uh, in close collaboration with INAC. So we've been in contact with the, uh, the chief from Fort Mackay for quite a while. Uh, we uh, facilitated with the Shell the uh, precautionary evacuation of uh, 60 uh, seniors or people with existing uh, respiratory uh, issues, uh, and that happened today. Uh, the issue is not uh, proximity to the uh, wildfire so much as it is the heavy smoke uh, that exists in the area. It is a bit of an isolated community, so we are concerned if the fire should shift uh, that we've asked for voluntary evacuation. The chief and council are looking at that right now, and again, in conjunction with Shell and the uh, Red Cross, uh, we have uh, airlift available to make that happen as soon as possible. We'll come back to the floor now. Uh, just a quick question. Um, Premier, you said earlier uh, that you were really encouraging people to get out of downtown Fort Murray if they were there. What are we hearing in terms of on the ground? Are there people still there? I know we've spoken with a few who say they are. Um, there, there, there are not a lot of people that are still there, but there are a, a few. There, there are a few people that are still there uh, that are um, perhaps not as interested in leaving. Uh, not great numbers at all, uh, but we have heard about small numbers, and so we are encouraging them to leave for all the reasons that we've just outlined in terms of the services that are up and running in the city right now, in terms of the gas line, you know, you know gas, power, water. Um, you know, those, those services are not there. So for the best interests of the people who, who remain there, they really should leave. Is there any way you can just arrest them and make them leave? Uh, we don't actually have that authority at the end of the day. We can ask them, but if they're in their homes, uh, we don't have the authority. Um, the vast, vast majority of people have left, to be perfectly clear. We're talking about very small numbers. Um, but, you know, quite honestly, we're very concerned about safety and the safety of everybody. And one fatality is one fatality too many. And so we really must urge everybody uh, to leave so that, that our first responders can focus on, on uh, fighting the fire, protecting the infrastructure, and reestablishing the, the uh, functionality of that infrastructure so that everybody can come back in. That should be their focus. Um, how are firefighters doing and how are they dealing with fatigue? Is there enough turnover and, and making sure that they get time to rest? Because we're seeing pictures online of firefighters completely exhausted and, and passed out on the ground. Chad Morrison again. Uh, yes, uh, we continue to uh, cycle firefighters through and, and bring more in to relieve them. Uh, and obviously, yes, there are photos of, uh, you know, that's how dire the situation is there. Um, our firefighters are, are working diligently and hard. Uh, many of our uh, Fire Centre folks, we've actually brought in relief and, and spelled them out already, uh, and that's actually happening uh, in numerous cases. And as uh, Scott had alluded to earlier, we've brought in out-of-province uh, fire teams to help with the, um, the Regional Emergency Operations Centre as well, so uh, those reliefs there, you know, and obviously uh, any firefighter there uh, is, is doing their ultimate best, and then we want to make sure that they're getting their breaks and their rest when they need to, and, and so that they can continue to come back. What's the role of the Army been thus far, and does that role need to be expanded? Uh, the role of DND primarily thus far has been they assisted in the evacuations of the airhead uh, with uh, one other aviation assets. Uh, they've helped deliver uh, foodstuffs to uh, the First Nation community uh, for CHIP that were running low, uh, who have also taken in uh, evacuees, uh, First Nations evacuees from Fort McMurray. Uh, they have been doing uh, night flights over uh, Fort McMurray and providing us with uh, some of their uh, capability to have a look at uh, the um, critical infrastructure and all of the good works that have been done within the community. 
they've got the ability to see through some of the smoke that we're having some challenges with. Uh, and they stand by uh, and ready to assist uh, with any other requirement we, we may have. At this point, are they more air support? Would you rather have more boots on the ground? Right now, they are air support. Uh, as Chad has said, we have sufficient boots on the ground, highly trained wild firefighters and fi uh, structural firefighters to do what is required. The DND has uh, leaned forward. They have done some of the basic firefighting requirements, their immediate reaction unit. So if the situation does deteriorate, they can be put into the fight as quickly as possible. So there is a possibility of them to be transitioned from air to ground if need be? Oh, absolutely. That, that can happen and relatively quickly if required. Right now, we have sufficient resources, trained personnel uh, to do what needs to be done. We're going to leave it there for today, guys. Thanks.